And we're live in five, three, two, one. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and today is Wednesday, January 17, 2024. Happy New Year if you've just dialed in for the first time. And I cordial welcome also to our new uh, research fellow from Germany, Dr. Julius Gestmeier. He's back here with his beautiful wife. Uh, cordial welcome to rainy Seattle. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll have a great year here. Today is our STED Talk series, Spine Technology Education. And the D, as I always point out, is a multi-interpretable uh, letter. It stands for debate, discussion, uh, discourse, um, things that we don't fully understand yet and need to sort out through interactive discussions. And we welcome yours in the chat room that I will man. Uh, we have a wonderful guest speaker today from sunny LA, Dr. Kenneth Illingworth. He's a pediatric orthopedic colleague with a dual qualification in trauma surgery. And again, in spine, this is not just adult spine. In fact, uh, it came out of pediatrics. And it's very cool to look at the power of operative and non-operative treatment with the emphasis on the latter today. And Dr. Illingworth, are you live yet, Dr. Illingworth? Because we have some cases for you. Oh, you got, uh, I, I'm, I'm live. Out. I'm here. I'll thank Ben and Corey for staffing things. Hi, Dr. Ellingworth. Good morning to you. Hey, how, how are you? Let's do a quick sound thank check. You. Can you hear me? Uh, so far, we have no audio, but we'll work on that. Make sure you're unmuted, please. So as always, we're starting with a couple of cases that uh, are somewhere not totally clear or hopefully have some uh, semblance uh, of uh, bearings to the a main topic today, and we obviously don't do pediatric deformities here. And I'm very curious to see what Dr. Ellingworth will show. I want to do some greater detail later. Dr. Ellingworth, can we have a sound check from you? I'm, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Still no audio, so we'll sort that out. First out of the shoot, I think we have three cases prepared. And uh, whenever, whenever you're unmuted, just uh, give us a sound signal. I'm unmuted. Dr. Patel is here Sorry. and he's ready, as always, with a case. Um, Dr. Ellingworth, I can hear you. Uh, um, ben uh, is working on our AV in the Thanks, general, in our conference you, room. So our quarterly, uh, just bear with us, OK? Uh, OK, Sounds good. Forum. We had some great lectures. And Dr. Harvey talked about uh, his very revolutionary idea of disc regeneration. So I hope that you'll, if you didn't catch it live, we'll key on it later on uh, in our library. Thank you for Corey and Ben again for handling it and Dr. Illingworth when wherever we can unmute you. Neil. <laughs> Yep, it's up on the, on the screen. Oh, oh, I see. I didn't, but I see what happened. It was off like that. I didn't switch it. I did not do that. I see what happened. Great. Thanks, man. All right, so my case for today is a 55-year-old male who fell in, in the shower. And this is all the history we got. He was kind of out of it for a while and we didn't have anything else with us. It presented as a trauma, is intact on exam, and uh, had, again, no significant pertinent labs, and got a kind of part of the trauma workup, got a head CT, got cervical CT, and this is the first image that they obtained before calling us. So you can see a C2 fracture. And I also want to call your attention to a little lower as well and has a facet fracture as well at C5-6, but that wasn't too bad. C2 was what we were worried about initially, so proceeded to get an MRI. Again, has some stenosis. Uh, which did not seem on physical exam to be symptomatic. He didn't have any hyperreflexia at the moment. Um, was able to move arms and legs okay. Uh, did have significant neck pain. 
and uh, with movement, even when he was in the Miami J cervical collar, just getting him in and out of bed and things like that was an issue. But he did ha does have clearly significant um, cervical C2 fracture and the facet fracture C5, 6. Can you scroll through the sagittal again? Yeah. The sagittal, Murray. This is a really tight stenosis, right? Yeah. And this yeah. gentleman is how old? 55. 55? Yeah. Fell in the shower. So is this one of those myelopathy or cold myelopathy manifestations? Right. Yeah. Dr. Illingworth, uh, have we sorted out your audio? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, Ken. Good morning to you. Sorry, the audio comes on our end, and we apologize for that. Yeah. So no, I, know no worries. You, I, I know you don't treat adults, uh, but you're trauma trained also. Uh, I'll introduce you more formally later for your lecture. Yeah. We're very much looking forward to that. But um, I saw that you're trauma trained also, at least pediatrically. Um, so this is something that we see a lot of. We see a lot of older people with uh, myelopathy, which was neglected or simply unknown because it's uh, a slow disease and then they fall and bad things happen. And this patient had a so-called hangman's fracture. Uh, is this something that you see in the pediatric world at all? <laughs> this is... Uh... This is what I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thankful that I, I treat patients that are at, at minimum 30 years less than this, because obviously this is a, a, a complex scenario on top of uh, you have your traumatic injuries and your fractures. Like you said, you have severe stenosis and probably underlying, uh, you know, myelopathy, which is, which has caused the initial injury. And, you know, in, in the pediatric realm, and I certainly treat pediatric cervical spine injuries and um, you know, oftentimes they're more uh, isolated and we don't have to deal with the stenosis aspect of it uh, or the myelopathy aspect of it. So uh, I'm curious to see what the plan is here. This would uh, this would definitely be a one I'd be interested to see what my colleagues would do. But it's a complex scenario because, uh, you know, it, you know, do you decompress and then you fuse the facet fracture at the bottom and then you have to deal with the hangman's fracture. So, you know, there, you've got multi-level injury that are, um, you know, not that close together. So my, my main thrust of my question will obviously revolve around the hangman's fracture, but uh, you address some of the main uh, issues first and foremost. In your, uh, this is a, a, a pet peeve of mine, in your uh, residency at Southern Illinois University and then your pediatric uh, fellowship, um, training in children's hospital. Did you feel that uh, myelopathy and detection of compressive uh, myelopathy was something that was well taught to the medical students and residents? Um, I would probably, uh, I would go more towards my resident training and I would say uh, there's always room for improvement. So probably not. Yeah, probably not. Because we, we never published it, but at uh, my former academic institution, uh, we sorely lacked any education yep. in this regard. Dr. Patel is from Penn State, uh, East Coast. So was that trained, were you trained in this in your neurosurgery residency? Um, the Maybe the symptoms of compressive myelopathy, we would do good uh, exams on, but treatment and, um, you know, kind of aggressive treatment of myelopathy, we did not. Yeah. Yeah. So now to the main topic at hand. So this gentleman has subaxial stenosis and he has a hangman's fracture. And we should probably, Neil, switch back to the CT scan yep. uh, if you have the coronal reformats. And so there's spondylosis, stenosis, and now there's something else going on. So whenever fractures enter the transverse foramina, we nowadays get what, Neil? CT angiogram, which we did. And here it is. So what is here? What do you, so do you put your cursor the, on it? I have I have our cursor kind of scrolling through the video, but in the coronal sections, let me start again here. So in the coronal sections, I did try to put both vertebral arteries in view, and you could see the unilateral vertebral artery filling, uh, so right side filling versus left kind of not filling in the lower C5, 6 region. And I'll, I'll scroll through that again in the sagittal and axial, and it becomes way more clear. So we have a vertebral artery injury. Are you involved in the trauma uh, world at all at your beautiful hospital, Cedar sinai uh, Not, certainly not with the adult population. If there's uh, pediatric tra spine trauma that comes in, I do, uh, I do manage that, though. 
So the, the age old question is CT angiogram versus MRA, uh, MR angiography. What's the current recommendation and why, Neil? Um, CT angiogram is better at, at kind of showing uh, the filling um, and it's much more sensitive, I think. And MRA, if you have already gotten a CT angiogram and then you or, or you already have gotten a CT scan and, and you're finding out that there's um, some kind of vertebral foramen fracture, then then we just kind of get the MRI and MRA together. But MRA is able to show you vertebral artery dissection better with the dissection flaps more clearly, um, and. Um, and kind of healing of things. So for follow-up, I think MRA is better. And it would also show you, if you wanted to look at any kind of embolic strokes, then you can get MRI, MRA combo um, to, to look at that as well. When CT scan would only show you, hey, there is some kind of dissection or occlusion, but it does not show you the shape, uh, type, or um, any other kind of uh, downstream pathologies from, from that. So now here we have two separate injuries and an underlying pathology. Um, one is, again, uh, a chronic spondylotic disease with stenosis. The second one is a facet fracture with moderate displacement at C67, was that it? Yeah. Uh, and a vertebral artery injury. And then we have a hangman's fracture a variant. It's a complex hangman's fracture. And Neil, the hangman's fracture specialist, what type of hangman's fracture? How do we classify those nowadays? Yeah, so you would have uh, A, B, and C um, of, for C2 fractures, and this would be type C where there is bony um, uh, involvement, ligamentous involvement, uh, and, uh, and some distraction. Um, otherwise, the true kind of, if you just want to look at uh, surgical versus not 11, greater than 11 degrees of angulation and three millimeters of distraction, uh, would be like the criteria for that, but. Okay, so uh, the point to you now, Dr. Illingworth, is so we have three injury um, entities kind of, uh, complicated by the vertebral artery injury. Um, hangman's fractures, so classically, um, to the present date, the main textbooks in our country start with non-surgical care, which is appropriate. Traction and recumbent treatment is identified by the usually younger authors uh, as a very appropriate treatment for hangman's fractures. So is this still state-of-the-art nowadays? And what does that mean uh, if you extrapolate that to an adult population? Where are the differences in terms of adults versus um, kids? So at least from, uh, from my point of view, at least in pediatric cervical trauma, I think we're, and even with, ligam to be honest, ligamentous injuries, I've, I've treated uh, non-operatively in the past, ones that may even be considered unstable. I think we're more inclined to do halo vest immobilizations in some of the um, of our adult colleagues, especially for some of these C1 fractures or these C2 fractures, which may be borderline, if you will. Um, this one's I can't really see for sure, but um, in terms of what the morphology of the fracture pattern is, but uh, we, we, we tend to be a little bit less aggressive about surgical uh, intervention and instrumentation, and oftentimes we'll use a halo vestal mobilization. Kids tolerate halo vestal mobilization so well, right? Your adult population, not, not as well. Although still uh, consideration in the adults to do halo vessel mobilization for some of these fractures, but kids do very, very well with it. So uh, we oftentimes do that if able to. So this is an important subject. Um, uh, what differences in terms of uh, complication rates do you quote parents if you have the option of a halo vest versus um, surgery? What, what are the leading complications? What are the incidences of these leading complications? Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about that in my talk, but anytime we're doing um, a halo application um, and halo vest, you know, it, you're, you have complications that are associated with the, the halo placement and the prolonged pin, pin placement, if you will, pin side infections, skull penetration, kids can have very thin skulls, and so you can have skull penetration of the pins, um, you can get cranial nerve injuries, uh, you can have um, issues with the vest itself. Kids tolerate these type of complications very, very well. Um, and so, you know, if you have a 
compliant family and a reliable family, uh, uh, these complications, although they exist, are easily managed. I think that's a that's a really important point. Um, uh, and so I, I personally think that the complications in adult uh, halo vest placements have been crassly understated. And my former partner, Rick Bransford, was the lead author on a larger retrospective study from Harborview of, I think, 280 patients where our complication rate was actually pretty low. But we did have a regular halo service. We put them on that much. And so we had expertise. And we had a fairly stringent protocol and the uh, patients had to come by every three weeks for pin inspections, pin infections being the dreaded most common things. Without taking away too much of your talk, um, do you take six pins routinely now? Are there eight pin indications? What's the paradigm for four versus six versus eight pins? Uh, I never do four because I'm a pediatric surgeon. So uh, I almost always do eight and sometimes I'll do 10 depending on the, yeah, I mean, sometimes you have really small kids who really need halo traction or need a halo vest immobilization, kids with osteogenesis imperfecta or some type of skeletal dysplasias and the, uh, the, um, the, the osseous, um, the strength of the skull just really isn't very good and you have trouble getting any type of real torque on your pins. So the more pins, the better on those kids. But usually my go-to is eight pins. Eight pins, was I try to get about four pounds of torque. Uh, sometimes you can only get two to four on these kids, but I try to get four, unlike the adults where we do four pins and, and more torque on them. So you mentioned the T word, torque. Give us numbers. I don't want you to take away too much from your talk, but uh, what, what inch pounds uh, do you use as a torque guidance? I try to get to four um on all on all of my pins but it's not uncommon because of the the uh, my patients are oftentimes not idiopathic and they have very severe underlying medical disease processes and bad bone and neuromuscular conditions and syndromic it's not uncommon for me to be um trying to put a halo pin in between two and four pounds and um you start getting some you know you start to you start to turn and then all of a sudden you realize you're starting to lose your purchase and at that point you just got to abort so sometimes we can only get up to around two to four which is not a lot so there's a proprioceptive component and there's, there's a couple absolutely a proprioceptive component uh and i'm always and i'm always the one holding the ring and what i say is you always want at least in my hands i always do this in the operating room because i'm a pediatric surgeon i want to torture kids in the er right but uh, you always want to have at least two experienced people with you because you really have to trust that they know what that proprioception feel is when they start losing that purchase. Uh, because if not, then you can just start driving that pin right through the skull. And it's easy to do on some of these kids. You'd be surprised. Yeah, no, we'll harp on that more later and investigate that more. Dr. Skouyan, so uh, back to the case here. We have a vertebral artery injury also, which was identified not clinically, but by radiographs. And this was done protocol driven uh, with a CTA. So briefly again, from your purview, CTA versus MRA. Neil said in uh, Penn State, they're taught to do CTAs. It's higher specificity. Um, what are your thoughts from a screening perspective versus specificity? I mean, I think uh, CTA is very reasonable because then you can look at the fracture as well. So I think, you know, CT is good. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting an MRA. Okay. So if a patient has a neuro deficit. And how do you rate uh, vertebral artery injuries? Yeah, so yeah. I have, I did get a before scale up here. And then again, the injuries are graded from grade one to five. One and two, uh, one is luminal irregularity or a dissection. You'd see with luminal narrowing of less than 25%. Grade two is greater than 25%. Grade three is pseudoaneurysm, four is occlusion, and five is tr uh, transaction with uh, free uh, extravasation. Um, and the treatment and prognosis kind of change with different grading, depending on the type of circulation, so carotid versus vertebral artery. So again, with these gradings, you'd put them on heparin or some kind of anticoagulation. <coughs> and uh, great. in carotid artery, um, um, grading increase, as the grades increase, the risk of stroke increases with every grade versus vertebral artery. As the 
the grade increase, at least for three and four, so between pseudoaneurysm and um, uh, occlusion, the, it remains almost the same. And the highest risk of stroke is actually with uh, luminal narrowing, uh, greater than 25% than it is even with occlusion. So this is kind of, you know, with the circle of Willis, um, flow through that and uh, backflow through uh, the other vertebral artery, if that's dominant, through the basilar, et cetera, it reduces some of the chances of stroke. If you completely occlude a vertebral artery, then you leave it half open um, with the luminal narrowing. So interesting to know. So where does this uh, fit in? Uh, for our patient, we have a full occlusion, so we are grade four with vertebral artery unilateral. So he's at 28% risk of having uh, any kind of strokes with therapy. Okay, so um, I know your adult uh, trauma time is over. Uh, this is what was done, and again, we have a better CT now. We did an ACDF, one of our colleagues did an ACDF C23 for the Hangman's fracture. And again, you can kind of see on these images that this is a very atypical Hangman's fracture. It's a shear fracture, uh, coronal split. The wording has been also that this is a uh, type, an atypical Hangman's fracture because it does not fit into the classic uh, one, two, three, um, F and D scale, yeah. and uh, Levine scale does not fit into that. So uh, in the AO criteria, it would be considered a type three. No doubt that this injury by itself could have been treated with uh, at least for some time bed rest, traction, and a collar. Now, if you go through the CT scan, the subaxial injury at C6-7 is still unstable. So Rod, what do you think about this decision by our partner who's not here so we can, we can go after him to fix one fracture of this dual unstable uh, non-contiguous yeah. setup? I mean, typically again, um, uh, it, was there an MRI? I missed it. There was yes, an there, MRI yeah. with significant stenosis. Yeah, I mean, boy, uh, I'm not sure I would have operated on the on the hangman's fracture. You know, I probably would have <clears throat> waited on that, and then you know, those usually heal, and do it doesn't look like there's that much angulation, and there's no disruption of the disc space unless I'm missing something. The fracture actually goes through the C1, yeah. C2 joint. So yeah, it's a coronal split fracture, so it's an atypical hangman's fracture. So the usual, but still, I mean, I think Yen's honestly, it's unilateral. Um, you know, I would, I would have gone after the other fracture as a first step. And then, you know, again, you can always, I, I think in my experience is, unless there's significant disruption of the C2-3 disc space um, and uh, there's significant angulation, you know, boy, I mean, I think there's a good chance that that could heal. But um, I, I think I would have gone for the C6-7 level first. What are the plans uh, for that level and how's the patient doing? So patient's doing great. He is, again, pain has improved significantly. He's working with physical therapy. He did get a swallowing study yesterday, uh, ordered uh, to get his, uh, to look at that. Um, otherwise, uh, we, we got to get him uh, better with the physical therapy, walking around more to understand the, how much myelopathy is playing a role, um, but his neck pain, which was his most important and significant complaint, has improved very significantly. What would you have done, Jens? I, I, I actually recommended fixing one of the two fractures. Um, uh -huh. uh, I am not against fixing that atypical odontoid fracture through a relatively atraumatic upper C-spine internal fixation from anterior. Posterior, this is a very difficult fracture yeah. to fix because you can't bridge the fracture reliably with screws. Over short along, this patient will need a subaxial procedure. And again, there's this tight window of trying to anticoagulate the patient at least for a while with antiplatelet um, medications due to the vertebral artery injury. Uh, there's no question that again, and this is why we thought this might be of uh, tangential at least interest for Dr. Illingworth, uh, that in principle, Hangman's fractures have a very benign track record in terms of healing potential. So no question. Uh, the problem is, again, this is usually a six week to, uh, uh, at least six weeks to get the fracture sticky before you mobilize them. Uh, and again, the atypical Hangman's fractures, as shown in a, a case series in JBGS by, I think, Adam Starr and others, 
um, in uh, over a decade ago are very unpredictable. And when they heal in malunions, it's a far more problematic fracture to fix. So I, I don't disagree with fixing this and keeping that C1, C2 joint uh, congress. Uh, there's no question that I feel a little bit uncomfortable because the vertebral artery injury is actually at the lower level. Mm -hmm. But if you want to fix that, you have to then contend if you go from posterior with a unilateral vertebral artery <laughs> that is out. Right. And so the contralateral instrumentation has to be done under extreme precautions to not injure the vertebral artery injury. So that means or implies that you probably have to do a multi-level fixation. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the vertebral the artery? Controversial case out of the question. So the plan right now is to keep him in a neck collar for a C67. Right. Uh, is there a radiculopathy with that unilateral no. facet fracture dislocation? No, he does not have it right now. Yeah. Okay. And what antiplatelet agents were used? Uh, he was on heparin drip because of the surgery. Now we're going to try to switch him to uh, some kind of anticoagulation. The does he have so swallowing pending. difficulties? He does. And that's anterior. why we got a swallow study yesterday, but it's pending. I mean, we ordered it. So how but, difficult is the swallowing now? Um, yeah, I don't think he's able to kind of get anything down. So without, that, that's yeah. the problem of yeah. upper uh, cervical anterior procedures, uh, and we'll talk about that in another case shortly. Right. So without a question, dysphagia, not dysphagia, frequently mispronounced, right. is a real problem. Dr. Ellingworth, uh, yeah. in I, your experience, I uh, and again, I you mentioned her? hangman's fractures, usually non-surgical care, and we fully agree. Uh, is there any role for anterior neck surgeries in your practice as a pediatrician for a neck fracture specifically? Oh, uh, yes, I, I've done a... I've done somehow a, we lost your audio. I'm not sure why. Oh, man. So it must I, be on our end. I can hear you, Dr. Ellingsworth. Yeah. So it's... Okay, now we hear you again. Can you hear me again? Yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly not as common as 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 in your guys' world of adult surgery. I've certainly done a, a, a handful of, uh, of anterior procedures such as ACDFs or trauma scenarios where you have to do a corpectomy and fusion for, uh, you know, spinal cord injuries and whatnot. But um, we just had a kid who had a... Um, um, what was likely a result of some Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which resulted in severe spinal cord compression, and we needed to do a corpectomy and anterior fusion. So it's certainly uh, certainly in our skill set, but we certainly don't do it as much as you guys. Can I ask you a question? That that vertebral artery that vertebral artery injury was that was at what level? Was it C six? Yeah, so the uh, that's the a key point. The artery injury is at C six seven on the side of that facet fracture dislocation. So this is a protocol driven study. Yeah, so I mean it's a the, it's a it's a it's a vertebral artery injury because of the instability that occurred during the during the mechanism injury, right? Yeah, I know we're so, leading. Let's go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, in my, you know, if that was a if that was a kid, in my mind, that that kid's getting some type of operative intervention for stabilization because if you're unstable enough to cause a vertebral artery uh, injury, I think you're unstable enough to get some type of surgical stabilization. Um, so it's an interesting conversation about that particular patient. Um, fortunately, I haven't dealt a whole lot with vertebral artery injuries. I just we had one kid who had a unstable os odontodium who actually presented to the ER at five years of age with a stroke uh, and ended up having a type two vertebral artery dissection, uh, which we which we ended up having to do. Um, uh, we staged him, he was on anticoagulation for three months and then we it completely neurologically recovered and we ba went back and did a, a occiput to a C2 fusion and he's doing great, but um, it does happen in kids as well, but not as frequently. That's a super interesting case. Love to see that. Have you published that yet? I know case. We report. Yeah, we just published it in the last couple of months. It's in JBJS Case Connector. I can send it to you. Sure. No, that's a very interesting case. And again, especially since Ozodontoidia always creates significant discussions. Um, and we actually still see a fair number of pediatric cases. I'll actually see one at 8.30 this morning um, with a fracture. So th this is a, a, a very interesting uh, although incidental, but uh, important um, contribution. So the next case is probably more to your liking from the pathology involved, uh, but it's an adult. And uh, here is Dr. Brian Anderson, who dutifully served in a lengthy scoliosis surgery with me, and he's recovered nicely, and he's going to talk about this case. Thank you. Hey, good morning. So my patient is a 73-year-old uh, female. She has a six-year history of progressive shoulder pain, neck pain, low back pain, she had some bilateral foot numbness uh, that is painless. She's in balanced gait ataxia, and she uses a tall four-wheeled uh, walker. 
and a soft neck collar um, to um, help with uh, keeping your eyes level. No history of trauma, no history of spine surgery. She's got normal bowel bladder function. And when we examine her, she's got a, uh, her head is tilted forward and to the left um, and it's held there uh, when she's standing. Um, she's it's marginally flexible when we get her uh, um, supine on the table and um, but she can't lift her head off the, uh, the bed. Uh, she has about four out of five uh, strength in the upper extremities, but this is felt to be more mechanical impairment and so she probably has good strength and her BMI is uh, fairly normal. Her history is significant for alcoholism, but she's been abstinent for several years and osteoporosis. Uh, she's previously been treated with, for, um, sorry, prolia. So you can see uh, standing and lateral scoliosis films for this patient. She has a, a rightward um, thoracolumbar scoliosis, and you can see her head is bent over and tilted forward. Her, her CBVA is 36 degrees, and she has a 75 degree dextroscoliosis, um, significant thoracic kyphosis, and then her PILL is um, fairly matched together. Here's an MRI of uh, sagittal T2 and axial, um, demonstrating that she has quite wide open cervical spine, um, no myelomalacia, um, no obvious uh, areas of stenosis in this area. And I'll add that we do have uh, MRIs of the um, uh, thoracolumbar area that I did not include, but they also are um, wide open without obvious stenosis. Here's a CT, sagittal and axial again, uh, demonstrates multi-level uh, spondies and also multi-level degenerative disc disease. Uh, spondylosis uh, without any fracture or jump facets. You can see there's a focal area of kyphosis at four or five, um, about 15 degrees, but otherwise she, uh, she has straightening of her neck. So in summary, we got a 73-year-old female, uh, neck and low back pain, dropped head syndrome. She has this acquired torticollis, thoracolumbar scoliosis, and um, since the time of uh, our workup, we've actually asked her to switch over to Forteo. Uh, which she's been on for about six months. And she has this remote history of alcoholism, which she's been abstinent for. So we come to our treatment. So Ken, one second, yeah, let's go back to this nice summary slide that you had. Dr. Illingworth, um, why does this happen? This is an adult. Was this a delayed or neglected pediatric condition, uh, dropped head syndrome, thoracolumbar scoliosis? What, what went wrong here in this patient? Can, you, can I see the, uh, there we go. What, yeah, so, it, it, you know, it's it's possible it, without having previous uh, films, you know, it's hard to determine what her potential curve looked like early on. Um, this is certainly, this is certainly the, the uh, a scenario which I talk to families about when, when I'm talking to kids and, and I had this conversation about six times yesterday in terms of surgical discussions is, is, these kids that I'm treating are often asymptomatic. They're playing sports or doing great. And you, you have to try to, to uh, really talk to them about what's the long-term consequences of a progressive scoliosis and then ultimately turns into a progressive degenerative scoliosis uh, later on in life. And so it's quite possible that she had a uh, even a scoliosis or even a kyphoscoliosis at a kid, which continued to progress over time, which has now led to more of a fixed deformity now associated with contractures, your required torticollis. And now this is a, this is a much bigger problem as a 73 year old than maybe it would have been if she had a, you know, 50 degree, you know, thoracolumbar curve, which may be indicated for a selective thoracolumbar fusion at the age of 15 or 16. Uh, but it's certainly quite possible this is a sequela of uh, untreated uh, uh, idiopathic scoliosis or idiopathic kyphoscoliosis. And I think you're going to, uh, I'm anticipating a lecture, but malnutrition. So this patient now has a marginally flexible uh, kyphosis. So I do something called a recumbent test where I lay patients supine on a yep. table, check their lower extremities, the hips especially. Mm -hmm and then see how their occiput can kind of get to the table. And I forgot how many finger breaths. I have a very high-tech measurement system with my finger <laughs> breaths uh, relative of occiput to the bed. How many finger breaths was she away? I think four or five, something like that. She didn't fully 
Correct. Yeah. Although the MRI looks that she can get back pretty well, but she partially corrected, but not fully. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what I would expect. And in, in looking at that X-ray, you would think that you might have some flexibility, but that looks to be uh, a fairly significant kyphosis. I mean, that kyphosis is certainly more than sixty degrees. I mean, that looks like you're approaching the, you know, the if you go all the way, measure all the way into the lumbar spine, you're looking at probably more of a ninety degree kyphosis, really. Um, and certainly there's going to be some rigidity there and, and from a, you know, if the patient's severely symptomatic and you're talking about deformity correction, you're talking about a, you know, a quite an extensive, uh, procedure probably up, you know, we have to deal with that cervical, you know, that cervical kyphosis is a little bit of an issue in terms of where you're going to stop your, you know, UIV, but this patient probably needs an extension up into the cervical spine. Uh, if you're talking about deformity correction. And this is exactly the point that we're going to lead to here. So this patient actually, I followed her for, I think, a year and a half or something like that. She actually progressively lost weight. Um, the particularly sad thing is this is a physician colleague. I'm not revealing too much uh, protected health information here. And uh, this colleague was serving at a larger university and was just kind of, she was a functioning alcoholic, kind of, um, and just got lost in the shuffle somehow uh, over time until things decompensated. But she, despite um, an intervention from her family and everybody around, um, continued to lose weight and she started aspirating. So her neck was the main problem. Is that a problem for your kids also? So with uh, cervical deformities um, and the dropped head syndrome, is that... Uh, is food intake and aspiration a clinical manifestation? Okay, so the easy answer to that is is yes. However, the kids who I treat who have those particular conditions are usually associated with some type of underlying neuromuscular syndromic. It's very you know we don't see idiopathic patients who who develop severe kyphosis or cervical kyphosis or cervical deformity. They usually have some underlying condition and their underlying condition usually puts them at risk for aspiration and, and uh, difficulties with swallowing at baseline. So certainly we see it, but it's usually in a context of some underlying medical condition, which is more likely the cause of it. I think that's a very insightful statement and dropped head syndrome. Do you have a dropped head syndrome in the pediatric world? Uh, very rarely, very rarely. Brian, what are the differential diagnoses in terms of causation for a dropped head syndrome that you've learned about? Yeah, so... Uh, Can you go back to that oh, I'm uh, sorry. summary slide? Yeah, yeah um, commonly it's a neuromuscular disorder. Um, uh, neuromuscular disorder, it can be some kind of central uh, disorder. Um, alcoholism can certainly um, cause uh, cause this, but things like myasthenia gravis, um, Parkinson's, um, kind of uh, Parkinson's, some so, kind of myopathy um, can lead to a dropped head disorder, at least in the adult population. Yeah, and then significant for our population also is post radiation. So usually nasopharyngeal cancers, yeah. radiation that basically destroys the extensor muscles, um, severe depression. Uh, is another factor. So uh, depressed mm -hmm. patients and then significant substance abuse beyond alcohol, where they basically um, are passed out for longer periods of time with a head forward. There's a newer substance called Trank, uh, where patients uh, sit or stand in a uh, bizarre camptochormic position, so forward flexed uh, position. And for some reason, this blows apart the spine and the balance of extensor and flexor muscles. Uh, so we have a patient right now, they were looking at whether we should or should not intervene surgically because there's not a simple cure for us. Mm -hmm. So going back to these images, uh, so you're going to talk about traction. And obviously, for this patient right now, she has a <coughs> dual focus of problems. She has a dropped head syndrome, which makes food intake progressively harder. And she has a scoliosis uh, below that uh, with no critical stenosis, but clearly a deranged issue. She also has osteoporosis, which now for a year has been treated with anti-resorptive and then with um, uh, anabolic agents. So is traction something that in a pediatric analog uh, you would commend? Or if you had a general faculty meeting uh, with your adult colleagues, would you recommend traction in this kind of a patient? Okay, if this was a pediatric patient, there's a thousand percent chance they're going into traction. Um, 
I, I, I love traction and you'll, you'll hear it. You'll hear it in my talk. I think traction is just an amazing thing, especially for young people. Um, we certainly have discussions about putting adults in traction occasionally during our adult conferences. Actually, one of my partners just reached out to me the other day asking me if he can use all of my setup uh, in terms of putting an adult in traction. I think it's not as probably there's a lot there's more to consider, if you will. Um, you have to have very um, I think you have to be very selective about patient selection. Uh, in terms of putting a, putting the adults into traction, but it would certainly be an option. And there's certainly studies to support that, uh, you know, halo traction is a good option in the adult population. Uh, in your home institution, Brian, would you have used traction in a, um, or have you used traction for protracted kind of deformity corrections or complex deformity corrections? In the pediatric population, yeah, we'd use halo traction um, quite commonly, yeah, for our scoliosis. You know this patient, would this have been an applicable uh, consideration of this patient? Absolutely, yeah. In this patient? Well, I mean, we did use some form of that. Um, yeah, intraoperatively, but right. yeah. over a sustained period of time, two to three weeks? Not necessary. Yeah. One problem in this patient was progressive weight loss or BMI, uh, now looking at the notes here, had decreased from like 24 to 20. Uh, below 18, we would have not operated on her. Mm -hmm. I've had some dropped head syndrome patients who've gone into very precarious malnutrition, and we usually put a, a peg tube into these patients beforehand uh, to afford uh, reliable um, nutrition um, during a period X while they recover. So. Um, Surgically now, going to one more time to the summary slide uh, before we move on to the next case, yeah. what would your option have been? I know you have to advise your adult colleagues now. So we have a cervical problem, which seems to be the priority from a breathing and food intake perspective. And then we have a thoracal lumbar deformity, which is a bother, but to the patient, nowhere close to her head and chin basically tilted off to the side. So what would you prioritize in which fashion? assuming that we can't do a global solution in this patient in one setting. Who, who are we asking? Are we asking the pediatric, pediatric guy? Yeah, pediatric guy, Dr. <laughs> Advise us. So you're saying we can't do this all in one setting? It's It would become a pretty overwhelming thing. I mean, in my humble hands, the uh, thoracal lumbar spine would be probably T3 to pelvis fusion, which is an eight hour procedure. The neck we'll talk about, uh, but uh, the way I do can, it, the six you, in, this, in this patient, you think you can, uh, it's hard for me to see the, the upper thoracic spine, but do you think you could reliably stop at T3 uh, on this particular patient? Not uh, at all. We'd have to, we have to deal with the neck over short or long. The neck, yeah. the neck is the main burden for her. She literally has her chin on her side. Yeah. I, I you know, again, it, this is, this is one that, you know, if if we're talking about uh, doing a big thoracal lumbar fusion, I agree it's, you know, that's a long procedure and uh, but stopping in the upper upper thoracic spine on this on this patient would would be for I would think would be a setup for proximal junctional kyphosis, which is why, you know, the the talk about the cervical spine is interesting because she's got that level of cervical kyphosis, but I think uh, if from a deformity correction standpoint, it, 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 even a even in a pediatric patient, I would see have to see what the traction did, but I would be worried that this is this is going to end up in the subaxial spine in terms of a fixation standpoint. If we're looking for a significant deformity correction, um, plus or minus to the pelvis, I agree with you that it's looking like it's at least L four, but likely to the pelvis. But you know that's plus or minus. Rod, yeah. Uh, so you have two main problem areas. Uh, it's a great discussion by Ken. Uh, cervical, cervical thoracic, uh, thoracal lumbar, all together. What would you do? I mean, honestly, I think the main concern for me is, you know, um, her level of deterioration just over a short period of time. Um, she almost has like a camptochormia. She has camptochormia. You know, has and boy, I mean. You, did she get tested for Parkinson's? Or, she does not have that. Yeah. I, I did not get a neurology yeah. consultation, but or, this is a post-alcoholism. Yeah, so. I mean, boy, I mean, with the with the bone density, I mean, I think, you know, <clears throat> this is anything short of, like, going to the pelvis, I just don't think it's going to hold. I mean, look at that bone. Um, you can barely see it on the lateral. 
And uh, one more time, Dr. Robert Wang, thank you for joining us here this morning from Arizona, by the way. Dr. Illingworth is a U of A grad. Uh, Preoperative optimization with a PEG tube or a feeding tubes, do you do that, Ken, to optimize patients who are borderline or malnourished prior to any surgery? Yes, for sure. What's your preferred uh, route of administration? Is it uh, a PEG tube? Is it an NG tube? Um, it's extremely variable depending on the child. However, um, a majority of the kids who are under already malnourished who need this type of treatment often come with a G tube already. Now, if if um, if they're malnourished and I'm planning on putting them in traction, we'll oftentimes put an NG tube in and uh, supplement nutrition that way and monitor, monitor their nutritional status and how, if they're gaining weight and whatnot. And there's a case that I have, which, which shows a little bit of that. Um, and then there can be discussions about whether a G2 need it, is needed for later, but I've certainly used both. Um, the G2, obviously it takes a little bit more planning um, because you know that has to be put in and then it, there's gotta be a little bit of a time frame from that to surgery and, and whatnot, so. And aside from measuring weight, height ratios, uh, do you use any uh, serologic uh, parameters to assess nutritional uh, uh, compensation or gains by the patient? So the the easy answer the easy answer is 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 yes, but it doesn't really guide. It's a lot of the times it's these kids again. These kids are going into traction for a prolonged period of time, and um, I, it it doesn't really impact. Um, my surgical decision, i.e. in terms of when I'm going to operate, we tried to just optimize them as much as possible. And then once their spine is says they're ready, then we proceed with surgery. Um, and that may be a good or bad answer. It may not be the appropriate one, but that's, that's tens of what we do. We try to optimize them as much as possible. So certainly we, we have laboratory evaluation, but it doesn't guide me and say, oh my goodness, we're, you know, we have a pre of this and now all of a sudden we need, we need four more weeks of traction. I don't, I don't do that. Great. Okay, Brian, let's take this forward. So we have a complex situation with a uh, former practicing uh, physician and uh, she has two problem areas with the uh, dropped head syndrome being the prior one, uh, the primary one, and a thorcolumbar stenosis, uh, not scoliosis, I should say, kyphoscosis below that, a camptochromiotype manifestation, most likely a post-alcoholic myopathy syndrome. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Yeah, so we did um, address her uh, cervical thoracic issue. Um, we started with a um, preoperative PEG tube placement the day before surgery. Um, uh, due to the risk of uh, further malnourishment um, and dysphagia. Uh, and then uh, we started with the patient uh, supine with Gardner-Wells tongs and 20 pounds of traction. And she actually corrected fairly nicely um, just with that modality. And then we did C3 to C7 ACDF um, from the supine position. And then we flipped prone and uh, we did a instrumented fusion from T2 to I'm sorry, C2 to T6. Um, it was an uneventful surgery. Otherwise, she got drains front and back and um, no interoperative complications. Um, here you can see that she has a nice correction with rest restoration of her lordosis. Uh, we didn't do a decompression since she didn't have any areas of stenosis. And here is a CT scan showing our correction. So while she was neutral on the table, we did not go for hyperlordosis. Right now, she is looking very extended to me. Did I overextend her to your uh, alignment eye, uh, Dr. Illingworth? Um, no, no, but I'm curious to see what the remainder of the story is, if there is more. There's not yet. Uh, we <laughs> And we left the rods long, caudally, and we put a distal hook go up going in there. Yeah, to try to, yeah. yeah. Uh, Do, what, what, um, um, what's your, what's your, uh, can you tell me what kind of what your thinking was on your lowest instrumented vertebrae? How did you decide where to stop? And so I, I certainly, in a, in a, in, in a child, I would have been deathly afraid of stopping at T6 right there based off of those standing films and risk of uh, distal junctional issues later on. Spot on. For me, this was right in the apex of the kyphosis, which you uh, uh, assiduously identified. 
And again, for me, the hope is that we can get mileage out of her uh, long enough, three months or so, that we can then do the thoracolumbopelvic um, completion of the surgery without having to open up the whole neck. So there's a there's a plan for staged for stage. Absolutely. Oh, okay. And then do you have or any any type of orthosis like a CTO or anything? Or? Well, we will see how that works. Probably just the Jewett uh, brace because she has a feeding tube in. I expect uh, that. To uh, be it. Yeah. In our uh, um, state, we should keep those in for about three months to get insurance coverage. So we have to prove a me medical need for three months. And our GI people don't want to put uh, peg tubes in uh, for below that time period. Okay, got it. So, so far, so good. And she's becoming icy. Rod, you're so the end, um, I mean, I think that's a beautiful reconstruction. So, are you going to, what were you were saying, it's staged? Yeah, we will do the thoracolumbar spine. And we'll then give how about are you going to connect the two? We'll just make a limited incision and do end to end connectors. Mm -hmm. This is a dual core rod system. So, we have mm -hmm. nice end to end connectors yeah. with that particular manufacturer. How's she doing, like, clinically? Yeah, she's doing well. Yeah. Um, she's tolerating uh, sips right now. Um, speech is following her, and a dietitian is following her for the peg. But um, otherwise, she's doing really. She's oh, very yeah. happy. Okay. She's got full motor strength, uh, same as pre-op. Great. Yeah, she has a neutral neck, but uh, clinically now, my my fear was, and this is again a question for a pediatric colleague. So I look at the C1 ring, and I may have given it about in the CT reform at about five, ten degrees extension. I try to usually have a pretty level ring. And I don't know what you use as a parameter to assess for reduction, but clinically she looks overextended to me. I mean, I intentionally used a smaller grafts. I'm infamous for using tall grafts, but they're like six and seven millimeters. The bottom one is 10 millimeters that I hinged the spine around. Did I overextend her? Any hints on how to assess deformity corrections on a kyphotic neck? I think, um... I, I think you uh, you adult guys are are, are way more uh, um, picky about these type of these type of thing than than us pediatric guys because oftentimes the the kids we're dealing with are uh, are you know like I said syndromic neuromuscular we're just trying to do the the best we can I think you did a I think you did a great job um, I certainly uh, I think the overall alignment you know looks looks pretty good yeah sure we can argue that maybe there's a little bit of uh, extension there. But as long as you, uh, you know, don't overcorrect the, the, you know, the remainder of the thoracic spine, she should be totally fine, right? That's my my go to now. Uh, clinically, she's not complained of it yet, and I'm telling her that we'll be balancing her spine with a thoracolumbopelvic yeah. fixation later. Yeah, you just got it. Like it, for that, you know, like like you said, balance balance is the key. You gotta you gotta balance the rest of the construct based off of where you've where you've locked this in now. Um, you know, and it could be easy if, if the spine allows to overcorrect more of that thoracic spine and then tilt her back more. Uh, so we have one more case that uh, we may not be able to get to. Um, uh, is that okay with you? Yeah, whatever. You we'll definitely present that. Uh, Dr. Y John Younghain, great question. Lengthening the sternocleidomastoideus from the anterior procedure. What approach do we use? This is actually a great point of discussion, Brian. What do we do anteriorly to get an anterior release? Oh, for this patient? For the approach, yeah. Dr. John Younghain uh, asks, what do we do for the anterior approach to get a soft tissue release? Uh, we did a carotid exposure. And on which side? On the left side. On the concavity side Correct. of the torticollis. Yeah. yeah. So we did do that. And by then coming from that left side through a carotid release, we basically had each level uh, um, uh, painstakingly take the uncovertebral joint osteophytes, which were large, their yeah. small fingertip size off, and nibble those down so we get an anterior release. We did not have to actually cut the sternocleidomastoideus. It was tight, um, but the, uh, the SCM was uh, after that anterior release was no matching one. We also put the grafts, especially the bottom one, on the left side eccentrically. So uh, on a coronal CT, we uh, you actually positioned them on that side of the torticollis to have a buttress for posterior. And then the spine fell into itself. So we did not have to actually cut the SCM. This might be different in some pediatric cases. Uh, well, it's, a, case. it's, a great, it's, a, it's a great point. Um, I've certainly learned that the hard way. Uh, I vividly remember I had a kid who had a, a congenital cervical uh, deformity. And when I put her on the table, you could really appreciate how tight her sternocleidomastoid was. And I certainly didn't consent her at that time for, we usually, we do a bipolar release. 
um, in um, uh, proximal and distal. Uh, so I had to go out to the family and, and say, hey, I got to add on, you know, a procedure and had a whole nother discussion as the kid was under anesthesia. So you have to always take into account that you may, especially in pediatrics, it's you may need a sternocleidomastoid release in order to get your correction. Great question, Dr. Young. And then if you can go back to the images one more time, Ben, uh, Dr. Amin Hanin was worried about remaining spondylolysis between C2-3. Um, uh, I always appreciate, Dr. Hanin, your, uh, your thoughtful uh, and detailed assessment. So if you go to that final post-operative CT, I'll, I'll take that one maybe, the sagittal CT. Um, I don't see any neurologic problem, and I think that's a pretty subtle thing. Rod, critique me. Is C23 spondylolisthesis, is that an issue? Um, I mean, I think you know, overall, I think you, the correction is great. You know, I think you have to look at the global alignment. I think you can't focus on one. Um, I wish we had a coronal. I bet her coronal is way, way up. Cor corrected. It seemed like she was really tilting to one side. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think on a case like this, you can't just look at one level. You have to look at the global alignment. And and again, I don't know when you're going to stage the second surgery, but... Three to six months. Yeah. I mean, I've had some catastrophic failures with Captocormia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like even going from T4 to pelvis, I had a patient who fractured at like T3, like mm -hmm. six weeks post-op. I have, there's no doubt that this is my leading concern and I did not have a simple or good answer and I was talking about how low to go. Uh, the C23 honestly does not worry me. In terms of an ACDF, um, I know that I will cause iatrogenic dysphagia in this patient simply from the anterior stretch of the esophagus. We were very careful about not over distracting the anterior retractor systems. But there's no doubt in my mind, as we saw from the previous hangman's fracture, going to C23 is another level of retraction on the superior laryngeal plexus and will induce further dysphagia, even if we do not instrument that level just put a graft and so for me the additional trauma to swallowing function uh, is outweighed by the benefits of just having a reasonable overall alignment any thoughts on that uh, Ken no I, I I agree okay so with this um, we'll thank uh, our presenters thank you we got through only two cases <clears throat> My apologies to Dr. Davis. He had a very interesting upper cervical tumor case, but there's no doubt we will show that in the near future. It's a great honor and privilege to go to LA um, to the beautiful Cedar Sinai Hospital and introduce Dr. Kenneth uh, Illingworth. Uh, he did his undergrad at the University of Arizona and his medical degree at the University of Tennessee. Uh, he did a research fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh, and um, he then did his internship and residency at Southern Illinois University. I saw the picture of uh, President Abraham Lincoln on his back. Uh, he can give us a reference for that. Um, and he did uh, uh, an interesting fellowship combination of musculoskeletal trauma and spinal deformity under Dr. Keith Gabriel. Um, and uh, then went on to the Children's Hospital in LA where he worked with Drs. Tolos, Gags, and Andras, so a superb triad of mentors. And he was there as an assistant professor and then uh, more recently switched uh, over um, into Cedar Sinai, and that's where he's speaking from today. He's the Director of Pediatric Orthopedic Trauma and Associate Residency Director of the Residency Program. He's a nationally renowned, despite his young year, uh, uh, academician. He has over 45 peer-reviewed articles and a frequent presenter, and this is uh, how I saw him also at a national conference, and reviews for all the main pediatric and spine journals. Uh, he's a, uh, uh, an avowed family father and just a great uh, human being, and we're so proud to have you here. And talk about something that in the adult world we may not use enough, and this case may have illustrated that, and that is actually traction and physical external means to realign desperately deformed patients, of which several I see later today in my clinic. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Dr. Illingworth, and uh, thank you for showing us a dimension in our practice that is woefully underrepresented. Uh, well, th thank you, Dr. Chapman. It's uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I'm not sure who you introduced because that person sounds uh, quite impressive, um, but uh, I do appreciate it. So we're going to talk a little bit about halo gravity traction in, in pediatric spine. And literally, this is probably 
the the greatest joy I get in my clinical practice is dealing with these particular kids. It's just absolutely amazing. I have no disclosures to talk about. So this is a, a typical deformity patient for me. Uh, this is an 11-year-old female, premenarchal, shows up to my clinic and mom says, well, it just started to get bad over the last few months, which I highly doubt. Uh, but she has a huge 120 degree curve and her spine is literally trying to escape her body. And so there's lots of decisions ahead in terms of how to deal with this particular patient and patients just like her. Do you observe her? She's still premenarchal. She's about to go through a period of peak height velocity or lots of growth. Are you worried about preserving some growth? Do you consider something like growing rod surgery? I think that is unlikely, especially given her age. And then all of a sudden you start considering surgical options. So posterior spinal fusion and instrumentation is our gold standard for deformity correction in the pediatric population. And then and in certain kids, do we consider intraoperative traction, which we already talked to a little bit about today, but do we consider any type of halo femoral traction? Do we consider some temporary internal distraction that one of my mentors, Dr. Skaggs, talks about quite frequently? Um, or do we consider something called halo gravity traction, which is a staged surgery approach, which allows us to stretch out the spine? So what is halo gravity traction? And in the era of, uh, of technological advancements and enabling technology, we have all kinds of robots and all kinds of O-arms and G-arms and all kinds of technological advancements. And when we think about halo gravity traction, it is almost like taking a step back in time where, where we're dealing with almost medieval racking type techniques where you know we're not dealing with the latest and greatest of technology, we're dealing with literally so something so simplistic, but has such a powerful impact, which I think is why it's so fascinating to me. And so what is halo gravity traction? And, and, and just quite simply, it involves putting a halo ring on a patient that could be range anywhere from a young patient to an older patient here, uh, and a series of, of hooks, rope, pulleys, and bars in order to stretch the spine out over time. And so what are the goals with halo gravity traction? Well, really it is the main goal for me is to stretch slowly and safely over time. These severe deformities, if you take oftentimes, if you try to take them back to the operating room and you try to do an initial correction, you're, you get into signal issues and you can get into neurological injuries. So stretch slowly and safely over time is the biggest thing for me. Also to allow for surgery. What do I mean from allow for surgery? Sometimes these deformities are so severe that you can't even go in there and put any type of instrumentation or any type of rods. It's just not possible. The spine can be literally folded back over on itself. And so just the process of trying to stretch that particular patient out can allow for surgery in the future. You can also potentially decrease the need for three column osteotomies. Um, you know, vertebral column resections, although we do, um, we try not to do them if we don't have to, because there's a significant increased risk of neurological injuries anytime we're doing a, a huge three column osteotomy for some type of spinal deformity. So we can potentially decrease the need for that. And at the same time, decrease the chances of neurological injuries, uh, both intraoperatively, as well as with the surgical te techniques and that we're using from a surgical perspective. It's also helpful during unplanned staging. Unplanned staging, meaning you get into the operating room and you run into some type of issue, halo gravity traction serves as a good potential option in select patients in order to stage that particular patient to get them back to the operating room at a later date. And as Dr. Chapman and others talked about already, the possibility of improving some preoperative nutrition is always important as well. Just some general General pointers on halo application. Again, we touched a little bit on this, the difference between adults and pediatric patients. Um, but here's just a representation of the of your safe zone for where you put your pin placement. And it's always, it's over the lateral two thirds of the brow, okay? And the reason for that is you want to avoid the super orbital, super trochlear nerve, which run down more over the medial third of the, uh, of the brow. And you don't want to be too lateral to where you're in the temporalis muscle. And as we already discussed, really in my hands, this is an operated procedure. This is in the operating room in a controlled environment and it really having experienced assistants who are, uh, who are used to and know how to place pins because I'm always the one holding the head. 
I am so OCD. I want that that halo to be in the most perfect position, right? And so I'm holding the halo. My assistants are the ones that are sequentially tightening, tightening the pins down uh, so that we can get our pins in the appropriate locations and make it as safe as possible. You always want to palpate the orbital ridge, make sure your pins are above there. You know, it would be a bad day if you stuck one in the orbital ridge right below it. You want to always tape the eyelids shut. That's another bad day. If you leave the eyelids untaped and you put a halo pin in there, all of a sudden the kid can't close their eyelid, then you're going back to the operating room and revising a pin. That's not a good conversation to have with your family. Um, mark your safe zone. So when I'm prepping my patient in the operating room, all right, I always do, do some chlor prep, but then I also take a betadine swab and I put a mark exactly where I want the pin to go. So everybody knows anteriorly over the lateral two thirds where I want those two pins to go on each side. And I mark it with a betadine. So we're all on the same page. And then as we discussed, we do about eight to 10 pins. My, my standard is eight. Even on my older patients that are uh, what you would call more adultish of age with good uh, you know, bony purchase, I still do eight. That's what I'm comfortable with. And you also have to remember when we're putting traction, we're hanging a lot of weight, potentially a lot of weight off somebody's head. So I feel much more comfortable with more pins and we try to torque to around uh, four pounds. But this is what our general setup looks like. Each of our patients has a walker, which again is a, a, is a bar and a, um, a pulley system with rope in order to provide sustained <laughs> pulling of the, uh, uh, on the halo ring in order to, to provide slow traction and slow stretching of the spine over time. Everybody has a walker and you can see over here, here's our, here's our bed setup. This is what it looks like on our patients. And yes, all of the patients who have this are just as happy as all three of these particular kids, but you can see quite a range of, of uh, on, uh, on kids that I do this in, all the way from the girl, all the way on the left, uh, who's a little four-year-old who we were stretching out all the way to my, my good friend over there on the far right, who's a 22-year-old who had a severe spinal deformity with Charcot-Marie tooth. And um, you can see that these kids tolerate this extremely well. Uh, a few years ago, they uh, a bunch of the thought leaders, at least in uh, the pediatric spine world, came up with this establishing consensus for some guidelines on use of, of halo gravity traction. Uh, and essentially, you want to use it on, on, on bigger curves. Curves that are over 90 degrees is tend to, tends to be the workhorse for this in terms of when we implement it. But we certainly do it on younger kids, depending on medical situations, optimization, and potentially in more moderate size curves of 60 to 90 degrees when we need to do respiratory or nutritional optimization. Certainly thoracic curves are um, do a little bit better than lumbar curves in terms of getting correction. However, I certainly don't shy away from severe lumbar curves and, and proceeding with some type of traction as well. Curves with high def, uh, DAR, DAR is your deformity angular ratio, which is essentially a measurement of the angularity of the spine. So if you have a, a large curve that is, has a very sharp angle at the apex, uh, that is a, that's a spine that has a high risk of neurological um, um, signal change intraoperatively, potential for neurological uh, changes uh, intraoperatively. Um, and in the young patients, you got to be uh, very careful. But we certainly don't shy away from, uh, from younger patients as well. We do these in kids with skeletal dysplasia, osteo osteogenesis imperfecta, and all types of underlying medical and uh, neuromuscular conditions. I tell, my, I tell all my trainees who do this with me, whether it's a resident or the fellows or med students, that really is traction is a, uh, in my hands, is a daily labor of love. Um, it's a daily labor of love for the residents, for the nursing staff, for all of the care team who's involved in taking care of these kids. But we start small, meaning that once we put the halo, a halo ring in, I admit all these kids to the hospital. I never send a kid home for uh, outpatient halo gravity traction, although people have published on it and do it. Uh, I do not uh, feel comfortable with that at this stage uh, in, in, in my life. And we start small and we sequentially look, work up and wait uh, over two weeks. Okay. So it's a sequential adding of weight over a two week period. So that by two weeks, we're getting to a maximum or a, uh, uh, a maximum weight. And I, I shoot for about 40 to 50% body weight at two weeks. Now, if you have a really young person, 50% body weight is not a lot, but when you start getting into the older kids or you get into the adult population, 
you got to imagine now all of a sudden we're talking about hanging 60, 70 pounds off somebody's head. Uh, again, medieval barbaric type things, but it's uh, it's amazing what this uh, what this technique can do, and they tolerate it quite well. So, you know, with the thought of hanging seventy pounds off somebody's head, I want eight. I want eight good pins, and and so that's why I, I'm always putting eight pins in in my kids. We remain them at goal weight for about two to four weeks. Okay, my mainstay is two weeks. Four weeks is a long time to be in the hospital and be in traction. Um, certainly, I have uh, colleagues who say six weeks is their standard, and then I also have colleagues who try to push the envelope as well and get them out a little faster in two, three weeks, if you will. Every child's a little bit different in terms of what they can tolerate. They need active daily pin side care, uh, and they really need a, uh, a, a multidisciplinary team in order to help take care of these kids. We know from, from our colleagues, this was a study out of WashU um, back in 2013, that you can get significant deformity correction and their paper found an average of 35% can be expected. And the big takeaway for me on this particular paper was, you know, the majority of your deformity correction happens between three to four weeks. This is when the spine really starts to settle down uh, and really starts to get the, the most amount of correction. And so, so this is what I tell families. I tell families, you can expect to get your most correction between the third and fourth week. Certainly that um, there's been papers also, they state that this is a valuable technique in the adult population to so always keep it in the back of your mind and that this could be a, an option for your adult patients, depending on the severity of the deformity uh, and the ability for the patients to potentially tolerate uh, such, a, uh, such a procedure and such an inpatient stay. It doesn't come without its complications, as Dr. Chapman already uh, alluded to. And this is a series from uh, Vernon Tolo and, and David Skaggs from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Uh, which they looked at their series of halo vest immobilizations as well as halo traction and found a 53% chance of some type of complication. Now, majority of those are easily treatable if monitored early, but they're important. Those, those are such as skull penetration, pin site infections, neurological injuries, the most common being cranial nerve palsies. You can also get uh, brachial plexus traction injuries, extremity weakness, and cervical radiculopathy I've had patients have. Uh, and Horner syndrome, as you can see over here on the right. So these are important comp complications to keep in mind. This is uh, this is the patient who has uh, had an underlying undiagnosed skeletal dysplasia uh, and was one year of age. And you can see this massive thoraco, or excuse me, cervical thoracic uh, kyphosis. And uh, there were some concerns that this particular child was starting to have some myelopathy signs. And, and so uh, um, we placed this kid into a halo. Um, but the real story here is you got to be very careful about your pin placement. This was a very, very, very early on in, in my career. And uh, as we were placing pins, I could barely get the torque up past one. And as we as I had, a, you know, people driving pins in and through the back, I, I looked over and I said, wow, that pin looks like we've driven in pretty far. And so we got a CT scan, which shows that you had some skull penetration here. So you got to be careful about these kids with poor poor bone quality, the skeletal dysplasia or osteogenesis imperfecta, your, your, you know, the book answer for adults is you drive these pins up to eight pounds, but in kids, you're highly likely not going to get that. And you're often going to get much less. So you got to be very careful. Also cranial nerve palsies, the most common being your sixth cranial nerve, uh, where you can get this abducens lateral nerve palsy. So every kid needs a cranial nerve examination every single day on top of a full uh, neurological exam to look for any signs of weakness or any signs of issues. This is this is one of the main reasons I don't send kids home with traction, even though some of my colleagues do, is that I don't trust any of the families. And you can see over here, this kid is actually in a halo vest immobilization, but this family came back and said, oh, well, this just happened. And you're like, oh my goodness, no, it did not, right? So you can see at where this pin basically migrated from. It migrated so much over time that it actually scarred in, and these pins had migrated all the way uh, cephalide, almost basically off of the skull, right? And so these these pins really require daily daily inspection in my hands, um, especially in the halo traction kids. There's another example of a pin site infection. Anytime you get pin site infections, you um, it loosens the pin. If you loosen the pin, you can get pin migration, and you can see this particular patient had both pin site infection, as well as early signs of pin loosening and pin migration required revision of his halo in the operating room. 
Here's another example of just a, 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 a pin site infection from a halo vessel mobilization. So got to be extremely diligent about these and, and really mo uh, close monitoring to make sure that these are treated appropriately. Okay, those are that's kind of the nuts and bolts. And now I have just a series of what I consider some of my favorite cases that, that I've ever done uh, in terms of dealing with the pediatric uh, spine population. And we can go through some of these. <laughs> So this is a kid, 15-year-old male with uh, spinal muscle, muscle muscular atrophy type 2. So he's cognitively totally normal, super smart kid from India, um, and uh, but he's full-time wheelchair, doesn't ambulate, okay, has, has function, motor function of the bilateral uppers and lowers, but is significantly weak and has very weak upper extremity um, motion as uh, movement as well. And you can see his curve here. He's got this 135 degrees of scoliosis as well as kyphosis. So he's got 135 degree kyphoscoliosis. In my neuromuscular population, this coronal curve doesn't get me too excited, meaning, you know, our goal in neuromuscular surgery really is to balance the head over the pel pelvis and optimize sitting balance so they have good quality life, life in their wheelchair. And I don't need to get that coronal curve all that, all that straight. We just need to balance them out. But dealing with that amount of kyphosis is a real challenge. Um, and it's a real challenge from a surgical perspective on a rigid curve and also dealing with um, intraoperatively from a surgical perspective in terms of surgical um, technique and also as well from risk factors from a neurological injury perspective. So this kid is a perfect candidate for me to undergo halo gravity traction. Uh, here's an example of him uh, in his halo gravity traction what you won't, what you, you can see his general hand position, right? He's got function of his hands. However, he's significantly weak. He actually ended up having a lower brachial on the left side, a lower trunk brachial plexus trunk injury. Uh, and we actually had to take some of his weight off and to allow that to recover. So you really need daily neurological examinations. Here's the kind of results that we can get. You know, there's a significant correction of both the scoliosis as well as the kyphosis, but really that kyphosis correction is is quite substantial and quite amazing. So we've taken somebody who is high risk for neurological injury intraoperatively in a challenging surgical case to, to one that's a much more enjoyable procedure when you're dealing with a 75 degree kyphosis instead of 135 degree kyphosis. But these kids really need a multidisciplinary team. Uh, these are why these kids in my hands are always inpatients. I don't send them out. It requires child life, nursing, a very dedicated family and care support system, such as parents, physical therapy, occupational therapy. This particular kid had a full-time caregiver and one's not pictured here. Residents, hospitalists, nutritionists, surgeons, anesthesiologists, um, GI doctors, um, other consulting services that are often needed for these very complex kids. So here he is after his final uh, deformity correction where he got a T2 to pelvis, posterior spinal fusion and instrumentation. Uh, you can see that his uh, coronal correction is improved. Certainly, it's not straight. I'm never planning on getting that straight, but you can you can appreciate his overall coronal balance. And again, this is kid's full time wheelchair, so really we're just trying to get him to have good sitting balance. His head is positioned nicely over his pelvis. No pelvic obliquity. Shoulders are nice and balanced. And you can appreciate the amount of sagittal correction that we got. And we lengthened this kid approximately four inches. So an excellent result in 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 terms of uh, dealing with these Faces kids. With his mom. Here's right? a video from his mom just talking about the experience. We had a purpose. So I didn't give my comfort of being in hospital that much of a thought than the purpose. My goal was more important. So we all were on one goal, that we need to get him fixed for sure. I know it looks barbaric when you do it with your kid, but trust me, it's one of the best procedures. If you have to do correct a scoliosis, that's one of the best procedures. He's eating well, he's breathing well, and he's looking good. He's much straighter, and he looks fantastic now. I think he's got a neck. He never had a neck before. So there's just an example of kind of the patient's perspective on 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 this procedure and 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 how well they do. Here's another kid. This is that 22 year old male probably more up the realm of maybe what you guys see in your adult practice, but this kid has Charcot-Marie Tooth. Um, he has a new diagnosis of scoliosis, never been evaluated, came from Russia. He's also got some lower extremity issues. Dr. Chapman at one point mentioned some uh, evaluation of the lower extremities. He's got significant flexion contracture on the, on the uh, left side, as well as an abduction contracture, as well as uh, some lower extremity issues, including a six centimeter leg length discrepancy. 
And if you zoom in here, you can get a real picture of what his, his uh, deformity profile is. You know, he's got a 110 degree thoracic curve and a 90 degree lumbar curve, but really that lumbar spine is slammed together in about an eight centimeter cephalab to caudal region. And in my hands, that's a, that's a real nightmare from a, from an operation pers uh, dissection perspective and trying to adequately get instrumentation in there without trying to stretch him out. But really his sagittal profile is so, is so impressive. He's completely backwards. He's got cervical kyphosis. He's got 54 degrees of thoracic lordosis and he's got lumbar kyphosis and he's got significant sagittal balance. I mean, this sagittal profile for me and somebody who doesn't deal a lot with adult sagittal profile deformities is a, is a real challenge. And so mostly because of his sagittal profile, again, we decided to proceed with traction. Here's his course over a four week time period. Now he got some modest correction. You know, I would call this modest correction from 110 degrees to 75 and his lumbar curve didn't correct that much from a, from a magnitude perspective, 90 to 70. But think, think about the much the space we, we generated for ourselves, right? And that lumbar spine is really kind of stretched out, even though the curve size is only 20 degrees improved. And, and look at the difference in his sagittal profile. So and just an amazing difference in terms of sagittal correction over a four-week time period. And now we're really set up to put him in a good sagittal profile and a kid who's ambulatory and mentally normal uh, in order to set him up for success long term. The other reason we decided to do traction on him is that kids with charcot marie tooth disorder can have unreliable neuromonitoring signals um, and, and you may be flying blind uh, in the operating room. So doing preoperative traction allows us for um, really monitoring neurological status prior to surgical intervention. Here's his post-operative x-rays. Again, he's getting, he got a T3 to pelvis posterior spinal fusion with some inner bodies at the uh, lumbosacral junction and lower lumbar spine. Uh, you can see our, our coronal plane correction, as well as our sagittal plane correction. Here's his whole body EOS, uh, again, demonstrating his deformity correction. He still has his cervical kyphosis that, you know, hopefully um, won't cause him a lot of issues in the future, but it, all, all in all, an amazing correction. And he's due to get his lower extremity lengthening procedures and foot reconstruction surgeries in about uh, six weeks from now in order to address his lower extremity. Uh, here he is uh, three months after surgery, one of my favorite patients of all time. Here he is with his mother and really a good support staff is absolutely vital. These parents are just so dedicated to their children. They do an amazing, they just do amazing. Here's another example. This is a four-year-old female, four-year-old female with this kyphoscoliosis over 110 degrees on both the, uh, uh, both the coronal and sagittal plane. This is a big problem. She had been undergoing serial casting since the age of one. Um, um, and she was going serial casting for three years. And this is what her deformity looks like after undergoing casting treatment. So this is a huge problem from a pulmonary development, thoracic growth perspective. If you don't treat these kids, they get pulmonary hypoplasia and they have a two times higher risk of mortality by the time they hit 40 years of age. So in orthopedics, was not often we deal with, you know, improving mortality rates, but this is one of the things in my practice where it's a real critical issue from pulmonary development. Here you can get an idea of what these some of these early onset scoliosis kids can look like. So she's got this huge right thoracic curvature, kyphosis, rib prominence. Oh, not to mention she weighs 10 kilos, 10 kilos, super small, not a huge soft tissue envelope, right? And so when we go back and look at her x-rays, you know, the ideal scenario for this kid is putting in magnetically controlled growing rods. However, the you have to have a, a straight segment of about seven centimeters in order to get those in. And so if you, if you mock that up on her x-ray, she has no straight segment on the sagittal spine that's going to allow for any type of uh, straight segment. And so this kid is uh, indicated for her halo gravity traction. Here's her, here she is playing soccer. Uh, in the family room. And then here's, oh, sorry, let me go back here. Let me play this video real quick. Bye. All So these kids do amazing. And as you can see, she has an NG tube for nutritional optimization. Um, here's her four weeks of traction, an amazing correction. It's now allowed us to actually consider putting mag magnetically controlled growing rods in. 
Uh, she significantly gained weight over those four weeks, nutritionally optimized, in my opinion. And here's what her correction looks like after surgery uh, with uh, magnetically controlled growing rods, which will what gives us the opportunity to lengthen her in the clinic. Here's what she looked like on the table. We I continue to use Halo Traction interoperatively, as well as some uh, uh, some skin uh, traction uh, lower on the lower half in order to keep these patients positioned on the table. And here's what she looks like clinically uh, at about six weeks after surgery. So doing quite well. Here's a kid, uh, neuromuscular scoliosis, 18 years of age. With these kids with these severe neuromuscular disorders, sometimes I like to actually level the pelvis and you can get a pretty good idea of how bad this coronal plane deformity is. 135 degrees, but really his head is way far off, right? And so really our goal here is to try to balance his head over his pelvis to optimize his sitting balance. Now he was taken to the operating room and we put, hey, the plan was to do halo femoral traction uh, intraoperatively with the one stage procedure. As we placed our halo femoral traction and started to place weight, as I was positioning and draping him, he started to lose his MEPs to the lower extremities. We took off the traction, MEPs came back put the traction back on, started to lose his MEPs, didn't even start surgery yet. So went out and talked with the family and the decision was to proceed with um, with halo gravity traction in order to slowly stretch him out and to monitor his neurological status so that we didn't cause uh, any type of uh, neurological injury. Here's his, his correction over four weeks, excellent improvements. Um, this, again, all my patients are always happy. You can see how happy he is doing an instruction. And, and here's his um, here's his correction with his spinal fusion to the pelvis at two years with excellent correction of his coronal and sagittal balance, no neurological injuries. This is the patient that we talked about earlier, uh, my little 11-year-old. I used to give a talk uh, that said what I learned in my first year of practice. Dr. Tolo, who's uh, one of my mentors, said that you may be able to do this kid without any traction, but in my hands, I thought traction would be the safest option uh, based off where I was in my stage of my career. She underwent four weeks of traction, excellent correction, underwent posterior spinal fusion instrumentation. And unfortunately, my what I learned in my first year of practice led into what I learned in my second year of practice, which are revision surgery. And uh, on this kid, I um, fool's gold to think I could stop at L5, which doesn't have a good track record. She ended up getting um, uh, loosening of her screws and needed an extension to the pelvis. Here's a young lady. Um, who had a previous uh, uh, intradural tumor excision from the lumbar spine and developed a 100-degree um, right thoracic curvature. My plan for this patient actually was not to do halo gravity traction, was planned to do a one-stage intraoperative uh, posterior spinal fusion instrumentation with possibility of uh, temporary internal distraction rod. And we had her all scheduled for surgery and I was seeing her the week before surgery and we were signing blood consents and, and so forth. And she said, well, but I'm a Jehovah's witness. I can't have a, I, I, I can't sign the blood consent. I said, wait a minute, we've been talking for like six months. And so this this thing popped its, popped its head up. And so we had a lengthy discussion. In my hands, this type of curve is a high risk for, uh, for signal loss. And if I have signal loss there's and I need to stage a procedure, I think there's also potentially significant increased uh, risk that I may need uh, allergenic blood transfusion. Um, and, and a Jehovah's Witness, I thought the safest thing to do was to proceed with halo gravity traction. Not because I thought the curve needed it, but because I thought it gave her the best chance of getting a deformity correction without losing sin signals intraoperatively um, and uh, decreasing the chance of needing any type of blood transfusion intraoperatively. So here she is after four weeks, uh, and here's her correction that she had with a two surgeon approach. This is the last case that I have. I'll run through it really quick. Here's a, um, a kid with golden hair syndrome, congenital cervical thoracic scoliosis of over 120 degrees. You can see the complexity of her deformity here with anterior fusions, lack of posterior midline elements, uh, and just a huge, huge problem, huge deformity here. Really, the mom's concern was that you know, her left ear was basically married to her left shoulder. She had been to multiple, multiple institutions, uh, went to see multiple, multiple different spine surgeons. And basically everybody told, every pediatric surgeon told her, this is, it's too complex. There's nothing to do, just kind of go away. And so when I was talking to mom, um, I said, listen, I don't know what we're going to do. And this is, I very rarely do I tell that to patients, it doesn't lead to with much confidence. Well, under with the families, but I said, listen, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do something. And I said, let's do some traction and see see what we get with the understanding that 
we don't know what we're going to get and where we're going to be in four weeks. If we're in a position where we might be able to do something surgically, we will. But if we're not, then we're going to have to think of alternative treatment options or, or solutions here. So she <laughs> went four weeks of traction. Again, here's just some videos of her in the traction. The kids do just amazingly well with this. I actually got called by the floor nurse over here, basically uh, saying that she was running down the hallways and ramming into the walls. And they wanted me to come up here and talk to her about stopping doing it. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't see any harm in it. Let her run around. So she did fantastic. She did awesome. You can see her head position is much improved. This is what her x-rays look like prior to surgery. And then we went in there and, and basically did a non-instrumented fusion with rib autograft and halo vestal mobilization. This is what she looked like after surgery. Here she is post-op. Here she is six months, one year, two years. And here she is three years out from surgery. Certainly this is not pretty to look at from a radiographic perspective, but if you look at her clinically, that left ear is not married to the left shoulder anymore. I certainly think there's there's more surgery in her future, but as long as she continues to maintain like this and doesn't have any continued progression, we'll continue to monitor and see how she does. So in conclusion, halo gravity traction is a powerful tool for spinal deformity correction. Um, prior to surgery requires a robust multidisciplinary team. And in my hands really can be used in a wide range of clinical circumstances that, as we've demonstrated so, through some of those cases. Thank you. Ken, that was outstanding. Makes me proud to be a spine surgeon and it's humbling uh, to see uh, your artistry and uh, your accomplishments. It's, these cases were fantastic. Quick questions, we are kind of out of time, but let me just run through some of those. Um, so uh, the retightening protocol, we were always taught to retighten pins and pin care. Can you just quickly address what your protocol is, what people are supposed to do, what chemicals, what cleaning and what retightening I means? I do half, um, half hydrogen peroxide, half, um, half water, half saline, uh, BID, so twice daily. And then um, retightening protocols. Uh, I do not. I do not routinely retighten on kids. I know that we do it in the adult population, um, and, but, but I don't. I also don't use lidocaine uh, when I'm putting the pins in because all all my kids are sleeping. Occasionally, we need to retighten pins, but it's not a routine practice for me. By the way, I want to point out our research fellow Cliff Pierre kindly put two references into the chat. So go to the chat. Uh, one paper is the uh, Bransford paper that I mentioned before from Harborview in an adult population with halos. Uh, this is a controlled retrospective study, uh, and it showed a much lower um, uh, failure rate than is frequently catastrophically purported by some interested authors. And it's an honest study from 2009 in spine. And the case report that you talked about, the osidontoidium and vertebral artery injury, uh, with first Arthur Finkel and yourself involved is also depicted from JBJS Case Connect. It just came out, so thank you to Cliff and thanks for that reference. Um, simple hospital cost phenomenon. So our administration is riding us hard on length of stay. We have some extremely sick people that we are privileged to take care of. Um, what are we supposed to think about uh, in terms of length of stay? How does this pencil out in your hospital? Um, I don't, <laughs> I'm going to give you an answer and it's not going to be the one that's going to help anybody who asked the question. I don't, I don't ask and they don't, they don't, they don't interfere. So, uh, you know, I'm in a hospital system, which is, um, is, is making a huge dedication, uh, to the pediatric population and, and, and making a huge push to developing a world-class pediatric institution, which is one of the reasons that, that I was brought over here. Um, and so part of that mission is to um, is to treat kids, treat underserved kids, treat kids with neuromuscular conditions, and treat kids who need this type of treatment, who who may need prolonged stay in the hospital without without huge financial incentives behind it. As a as a political answer for you. Kudos to you and congratulations <laughs> on that. Our hospital system when I arrived in 2014 took away our uh, traction setups for beds. We don't even have them anymore. I, I used to have traction setups uh, in my previous uh, Harborview era, but I think f even there they've vanished and they have modern anti-decubitus beds, which is the priority. So the traction setup era is over. Um, and uh, Dr. Carlos Tello was mentioning it also. So home traction you don't like. Um, do you ever use home traction? 
No, I've, I've never done it. Um, that I've seen too many times where I've walked into a kid's room and everybody says they're doing great. And I start examining them and we start talking to them. They say, oh, well, no, I've got this shooting pain going down my arm or, oh, you know, well, everything's fine, but I can't move these two fingers anymore. And they go, what? No, everybody goes, you didn't tell that to anybody else. And then all of a sudden you're, you're, you know, if you're, I worry if you're at home, all of a sudden you turn something that is a reversible neurological palsy into a, uh, a permanent neurological palsy or, or other issue. So I currently don't do it. And so the great points, um, final questions from me. Uh, so pulmonary function, especially a case one and, um, actual measuring trunk height, uh, until recently, one of our fellows actually had that observation is published now, Zach Tartarin. I don't know who the first author is, uh, published on height gain in adults with scoliosis. Have you actually ever measured height gain, uh, like C7 to lumbopelvic junction or something like that in these kids? I know it's a difficult thing because he had the growth dynamic also, but height gain, is that something that you looked at? Um, uh, certainly as a, um, as a pediatric uh, specialty, we have uh, abundant data on, um, on uh, like uh, T1 to sacral and, and thoracic growth in our early onset kids. I don't, I don't routinely look at it from a pre to post-operative perspective. Um, you know, on, on these kids, I do worry or do think about it as I'm lengthening them. Uh, we tend to lengthen these kids. Um, if they're a, a, a magic rod, a magnetically controlled growing rod, we lengthen them about three millimeters every four months. Um, and um, if they have traditional growing rods, we have to go in and surgically lengthen them. We lengthen them about a centimeter every six to nine months. And our friend, final question for me, Amir Aziz from uh, Pakistan. Uh, Salam, Amir. Uh, he identified halo pelvic ilizarov uh, that he congratulated on your cases, by the way. He likes that. He thinks it's more humane, three millimeters a day through four rods. Uh, ilizarov, uh, uh, cranial pelvic uh, um, distraction. Is that something that you know having armamentarium? Any comments on that? Uh, I've seen it before uh, um, in presentations and uh, publications. It is not something that uh, we routinely institute uh, in our institution or uh, not something that we routinely, that I know of that my colleagues throughout at least the United States routinely institute. But certainly, certainly it alleviates some of the traction related issues. Yeah, no, I think I appreciate Amir Singh. I've seen it also in pictures and I'm always amazed at it. And, um, uh, so we'll have Amir present. Amir, you're actively texting. Uh, get in touch with us. We'll, we'll schedule you and you'll present it. And we'll have uh, Ken and his team comment because we all want to learn from you and you do some amazing things. I know I've appreciated your work for a long time. So Amir, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll get you in. Ken, thank you so much for your time and sharing these wonderful cases that uh, are very inspiring for the spine community as a whole. And we can all learn from the uh, dedication towards trying to get patients into a better state and the power of spine surgery. Well done. And there are many things that we can still learn and improve. Uh, by the way, Cliff uh, put the reference about height gain into the chat room. Uh, it was just published in JVJS and the first author is Diebo, D-I-E-B-O. So go into the chat room. Height restoration adults, a uh, long overlooked separation of the ribs from the pelvis seems to be a substantial uh, um, predictor of lung function and digestive function, as well as uh, general outcome uh, benefit for reduction maneuvers. So, so thank you, Dr. Illingworth, uh, and congratulations to your team uh, that you've emphasized so much and hope to have you here many more times. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Awesome.